Hello and welcome back to Curiously Polar, the podcast about all things very north and very south. And uh, it's time again to talk about Arctic and Antarctic things. I'm Chris Marquardt and Henry's with me. As, as How are you week. today? I'm yeah, I'm doing good. I'm fi- I'm fighting uh, some some dust, like you know, house dust. I don't know whether there's a bit of an allergy kind of thing going on. No, no COVID. Oh, no COVID. That's something you don't need. No, not really. Certainly. But um, <laughs> we'll get we'll get through this. Ah, so last week we talked about the. Um, the big 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 iceberg uh today we want to still stay in the antarctic with um yes. well let's move closer to the pole i guess yes likely it's a very interesting headline actually um just titling the the episode of lost year yeah it could be like an, an overall um summary of uh, 2020 in in, in polar <laughs> research but I think. is it really lost <laughs> in many I ways mean- there's so much stuff that, that was going on, despite a lot of us not getting out as much. So I don't think there it's was really still a, a lot going on. But the um, polar research programs they needed to to minimize their their efforts in, mm-hmm. in a lot of research facilities. Um, I just read in, in an interview with the hat of the Australian and Arctic Division, who said that they also for the for the coming season they're not sure if they can actually um embark with the full planned uh team size to Mm -hmm. the antarctic research so it had a a antarctic research means you have to do a lot locally right it's you can't really do uh, a lot of that just remotely it's not possible no that's that's exactly the thing in antarctica it's such a huge vast uh, space that you really need to to be on spot on location to to be um, able to gather the data you need for your for your research yeah hmm. okay so um it has anything been going on i mean it's it certainly has not come to a full complete stop has it oh no no no, no. There, there still is a lot uh, of, of research going on don't don't get get me wrong here so um even though the the national antarctic programs have been um cut down they are still going on it's, it's very little um capabilities that have been completely cut off so you still have uh, researchers in antarctica and some of them actually stayed longer uh from last summer we remember um the end of the antarctic summer that was the, the the peak of uh COVID, and um that made it difficult for them to to go out to to leave the continent so some of them needed to stay longer then the winter just kicked in which ends now or it uh, has ended already and now we have summer so now we have the antarctic research on the continent in its peak so we have the peak summer now 21st of december is summer solstice down in the south so that's kind of the turning point so for all the antarctic programs that also means this is a vital point um in the seasonal schedule everything you can't manage before the summer solstice gets much more unlikely in the second half of that season because it's a very very brief very very short season you need to to travel with all the logistics to Antarctica. you have to get everything off the ships on the airplanes and have to transport it to the distinct destination and facilitate or um, use it in construction or store it properly uh, so it can actually overwinter and then can use can be used next summer so we we are at the moment where everything everything gets really tight in in, uh, in a schedule um meaning and that's um, what makes this particular part of the season very interesting but yeah still a lot of research going on a lot of research going on and <clears throat> a part of the research that we talked about in less in the last episode a 68a the big iceberg um that's moving um yeah you let's let's just briefly brush on that because i think you have brought us something new regarding that i did i uh, got some pictures and um we just want to share that also in the show notes um with a link to the website of Euronews news and um the the U, um the uk air force the royal air force has um commissioned a plane to just circle over the iceberg and uh just make some pictures and it's the first 
aerial pictures of that iceberg. Oh, the, the new is not the first. The newest um, aerial pictures of that iceberg and probably never got such detailed pictures of A68A. And you can see here, for example, on, on, on that particular picture, and if you just uh, tune in on an audio device, just swap over to YouTube and just uh, join us on the video and can see <laughs> the, some of the, the footage. are quite compelling. I mean, this is, um, this is just a, a small little part of the edge of the iceberg, but it kind of gives you an idea of the scale, I guess. But exactly, and th this gives you just an idea of the, of the big uh, ice wall we are facing when we're approaching the iceberg. So right. that's one part of it. It's a very small edge, uh, roughly 30 meters high above sea level. And the second picture here, that's probably the most compelling one because you always have the big question of why don't we get a picture, a photo, a photography of the whole iceberg in one piece. <laughs> this picture explains that. It's a humongous piece of ice. Just remember four and a half thousand square kilometers. And, and, and remember this is just... the, the height of this is like 30 meters above the waterline. So that what looks like a thin kind of crust of ice is actually a huge amount of frozen water here. In Indeed, it is, and you you just see it's kind of a little indention. It looks like a like a bay. Um, it almost looks like an ice shelf, and that's actually where it originates from. So it gives you an idea how uh, the ice shelves coming down from Antarctica look like where they end. Um, but this here, just the floating piece of ice close to South Georgia now. So this is just a very very amazing piece yeah. of uh, photography. And then you have the brush eyes there, which looks like brush eyes. It's not. It's growlers. It's really big chunks of ice. So that they have. So this size. comes off the iceberg. This is uh, pieces that have broken off, or yeah. This is when 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 ice uh, when from from the large iceberg, smaller tabular ones just break off. Then you have a lot of small um, debris, and that's the brush eyes we see in this picture. Yep. So all those small break off pieces, and they usually gather, they join um, due to currents, and then you have this brush coming together. I see. So there's and the more... last picture or the last two pictures, <laughs> we have a beautiful tunnel here, like a little cave. A little so you cave see, there are meltwater straight high. Right? <laughs> So yeah, that entrance might be 20, uh, 25 meters high. Yes. Um, that that might be very interesting to go in with a zodiac. But you also can see under the cave, you see the tunnel, you see the black funnel um, yeah. leading from that cave out of the ice. So that melt water just cuts through the ice, and those rifts, those cuts, that's what's interest the the scientists because that's the very likely new break of part. And do you really want to go in there with a zodiac? I mean, this doesn't look safe. It's no, it's probably not safe. No, probably more a remote vehicle. And yeah. all operation uh, manuals would certainly tell you not to say no. <laughs> don't don't go. And uh. the last picture here, you see the bottom of the airplane or, or the aft of the airplane uh, where the pictures were taken from, and you see the big iceberg, and you see the the yeah, I just say smaller break-offs there. And those yeah. smaller break-offs, they are tiny compared to the main iceberg, but they're still significantly huge tabular icebergs, a clear threat for uh, shipping. So you don't want to get close of, uh, of those ones with a ship. Um, particularly with a cargo vessel or stuff. So, so that's, that's like icebergs, you... uh, icebergs like one that might have sunk the Titanic. I mean... Size-wise, maybe something. Size-wise, like maybe um, the ones that sunk the Titanic might have looked a bit different because yes. they were um, a break off from from a, a glacial edge, so you have more rucked ones. They are not that tabular; they're but, not flat. But just, just, just as a as a as a on a threat level comparison, I guess um, this this yeah. is as threatening to current uh, uh, shipping vessels and other vessels as the other iceberg was for the Titanic. So there's a, there's some true danger when these things are out there. Indeed, yes. Yeah, and um, I, I'm just checking at this very moment um, the NASA world, uh, world view, and uh, indeed, the uh, ice eight a has not uh, taken. We remember from the last episode, we have um, yeah. South Georgia on one side, and then we have um, the the bat um, the bat rock of the um, of the continental shelf uh, around South Georgia, and we hoped it could go uh, go on the on the eastern part of uh, on the western part along um, South Georgia. It looks like it follows 
the uh, forecasted route along the the south coast of South Georgia. It's uh, kind of parallel to South Georgia now along the south coast, and very likely either gets grounded on the south coast of South Georgia, or yep. um, if we're lucky enough, it just circles around the southeastern edge. <sighs> Exciting! Exciting! Exciting, but this is not today's episode. That's no. just a recap from last <laughs> week's episode. So, what 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 are we going to look at today? What have you brought us? I would love to um, go into one topic which interests me personally very very much, but is very little covered. And I think the biggest challenge here is language, and that's the Russian Antarctic program. Oh. Um, Russia signs is really something that's kind of a white white spot um, internationally, no matter if that's Arctic or Antarctic. And today I would love to just g dive a little bit into uh, Russian Antarctic program, um, which started roughly 55, 1955, with um, the first setup um, of, uh, yeah, the first research station in, in 1956. Um, and then from there, they just took it in the International Geophysical Year and established probably the, the most, you know, best known Antarctic research station, and that's Vostok, which is also probably the most isolated research station in the whole world. Mm. It's 1,400 kilometers away from all coasts. It's at the pole of inaccessibility in the Southern Hemisphere, which means it's furthest away from all axes in all directions. And if you see those those terms, it gives you an idea of where this might be. It's not only interesting because it sits on top of the largest subglacial lake ever discovered, Lake Vostok, uh, named after the station. But it's also, this station is just very, very famous um, among scientists. And it should be much more famous among non-scientists, about non-academics as well, because what we have here in that um, particular research station is this ice core drilling project. And um, we talked about ice core drillings already in, um, in previous episodes. And one of the most important ice cores has been uh, emerged here from um, the Vostok station, which dates back 600,000 years continuously on climate record on this ice core. And that's a very, very interesting thing if you consider another fact, and that that Vostok station, built in 1957, has undergone renovation once in 1978. Oh, wow. So we have the time capsule. a facility, <laughs> exactly, that is kind of a time capsule of previous expeditions. Mm -hmm. It's far from being a modern laboratory, which we kind of expect, or when, when, we, when we think about Antarctic research stations, we have this super fancy sci-fi laboratories in mind. We think, okay, they go down there and then it's a little bit like space station on a lost in space or something like that. It's not. This is a very basic station, Vostok, even though it has a very huge importance, not only for the Russian Antarctic program, but also for all the cooperation, the scientific cooperations they're doing with America, with Germany, with um, the, the British Antarctic Survey, and so on and so on. So we have a lot of international scientists coming there and then you get a, a look inside to Vostok station and it looks really pretty much like to the times of the heroic age of exploration. It's really something that is a time capsule. Today, the main facilities on that station, they lie under meter thick snow, which is good and bad um, at the same time. So it's good because it's insulating it. So you need less effort to heat it up because it really stays in, in that capsule. Mm -hmm. The bad thing is they really make tunnels to get access to um, those facilities. It was closed for a number of years um, due to a lack of, of uh, financing. But other than that, that's an all year round workspace. So for, for a, a number of people, I think it's 13, they stay in winter there. This kind of capsule is a very tiny one. You can't just leave that place. Just imagine the average temperature on that on that place. The average annual temperature is minus fifty five degrees Celsius. That is crazy. average. You can't just go out and take a breather and just enjoy the sky or the northern uh, the southern lights or whatever. It's really like the the place is inside 
in the research facilities. So and so, it, it, I, I just want to contrast this with uh, uh, today. It's the tenth of December, twenty twenty, and people are complaining about a bit of lockdown. <laughs> just imagine you're in Vostok Station. <laughs> there is a permanent lockdown, pretty much. I mean, you can go out, but it is it has to be planned. It has to be managed. Uh, it's not just uh, yeah. You can't just take a stroll if you need to. During summertime, they might be lucky and have temperatures yeah. minus 20 degrees or minus 30. Yeah, so, it's still um, very cold. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you can do something about that. That's better than minus 90. Yeah. Um, it's a place where they measure the coldest temperatures on Earth, minus 90, 80 degrees centigrade. Just imagine yeah. that. It's just, it's just out of comprehension. It's really a, a different world. But yeah, when we when we um, complain about our own situation being in lockdown, we figure we are very social animals. We are very social in, in terms of we need contact to other people. Yes. Scientists in Antarctica have faced that all the time, especially when you were over winter. You can't just leave the facility. You, you, you're stuck with the people you were stuck with. It's just there's no possibility to just leave it because uh, you just have a disagreement. You can't like, just go like ISS, somewhere, go home, right? It's, it's, it's like yes, it's, it's pretty like much like space station. Yes. There's just no going yes. outside just uh, for fun. Yeah, indeed. So what happened here is that um, because the the Vostok station is so old but also so important that Russia has actually, after years and years of talking about it, decided in 2018 to actually renew the station. And they were looking for funding, and they got funding from private sources, um, largely from uh, Novatek, which is the second largest Russian um, gas company after Gazprom, and from uh, a Swedish millionaire as well. And they chipped in money to just build new facilities. And those new facilities um, are focusing on yeah, just renew the entire thing. They want to um, just conserve the, the the old station as it is and just keep it there and place something that actually deals with the um, situation on location, on spot. And they learned, they looked how do other um, Antarctic programs deal with that situation. They looked, for example, how the Alfred Wagner Institute is um, just working on the new Mara 3 station. They looked to the British Antarctic Survey. They very recently have replaced their Halley 5 research station with a complete new build. And um, let's have a look on a video how that Halley 6 station was built, because what we have here is a complete um, different approach on uh, previous research station. Previous research stations were just containers or buildings built on the on the top of the snow, and over time just would accumulate more snow on top of them. Still, even though it's a very dry continent, we still have um, some snow falling down, and it's not melting. It's still cold enough that it stays, and all this will just add up and just sink down the research station at a point. So you have to bring all those um, materials for the station to Antarctica, um, largely on icebreakers and on big ships. Then they're just unloaded onto sea ice, on fast ice, which is um, connected to the shelf ice. And then from the sea ice onto the shelf ice with big, super huge sludges and tractors <laughs> and caterpillars and cranes. And then they built this ground framework, the structure, and you can see it looks like it's on skis. And that's my purpose. So you have those pylons that lift up the station above the level. So actually, that's what they call snow management. You've got some nice view, uh, views here from some snowy dice uh, do construction time. And then you see how that also can replace. And that was a very important factor. You remember a few episodes ago, we talked about the, the vanishing um, emperor penguin colony at Halley Bay. Right. That is the research station that's situated close by. And you remember that crack in the shelf ice? That station needed to be relocated. Oh, and so they just pulled it uh, to another place on, on, this, on its skis, on its skates. It, it, sounds, it sounds very easy, but the logistics behind just Pulling it to a new place is a very difficult one. So you have several different compartments, the largest one being the living modules, yeah. The, yeah, where, they, where they sleep, where they eat, where they uh, socialize. They even have a pool then table. Ha I mean, it looks quite comfortable, but then you cannot really go outside that much. So I guess you have to make it comfortable somehow. 
Exactly. You have yeah. to make it a home away from home. And uh, yeah, you see here where the base commander um, commander's office is. You see a lot of laboratories. You see a lot of workshops. You see the galley, a very important one. And you see that's like the, the, the construction team here in that video. Yeah. That is the Halley 6 station. It looks like a UFO somewhere landed in the middle of Antarctica. But it makes perfect it's, sense to build it that way, yes. And that's exactly what it's designed for. Um, the, the whole um, structure, the whole architecture is designed for um, replacing the snow, being able to deal with the snow situation there, but also to move it from A to B. Remember a few episodes ago, we talked about the vanishing um, emperor penguin colony at Halley Bay. That's right. a research station closely situated there. Oh, that's the one. And, okay. we and we remember that crack in the shelf ice where Halley Station is um, based on. So that was the reason why they needed to move the station and the design of the station is perfect for that it's it's capable of being moved to a new location according to um the situation now we have um a completely different setup here at halley halley is a coastal station it's situated on the shelf ice very close to the sea so we have completely different setup at Vostok station, which is on the continent itself. It's pretty much, it's 1,500 kilometers away from, from the South Pole. It's pretty much on the ice cap. So we have roughly 45 degrees centigrade difference on the average annual temperature from Halley 6 to Vostok. So we have to, um, if we take that design, we have to adapt it. And that's what the Russians did. So they just took the design, they just um, took the learnings from the other Antarctic programs, like the uh, the numerous uh, three station from, from the Germans, um, the Halley station from the Brits, and they just adapted it to the needs in mm -hmm. uh, in Vostok. And what they came up with is a new design of the, of the Vostok station, which is a completely different range of possibilities for research at that location compared mm -hmm. to the existing infrastructure. And let's just have a look um, onto what they have there. Is it that video here? It is this. In that video, you see that's how Vostok looks today. Yeah, we have the research facilities, very, very little um, uh, surface um, buildings here. That's the entrance in the snow, which the has to be dug snow, out yes. <laughs> every season. Oh, they man. just walk into the snow and uh, go into the station itself. And it this is kind of how similar, doesn't it? It does look very one? similar. It's that's the idea of the new one. That's just a mock up. So they, they took the design. It's also built on pylons to have a better snow management situation. You see, that's how it got delivered. It gets onto um, onto the slats and needs to be transferred from the coastal areas. So just remember, it needs to be delivered to the continent. So it needs to be delivered to a coastal station. That's the progress station um, of the Russian Antarctic um, Research Institute. And from there, it has to be transported 1,500 kilometers on slats. That's just a huge distance. And it looks very easy here. Look at those beautiful caterpillars. Right. It's not that easy. <laughs> it's not that you have this plain white area we've just seen in this video. It's not that the uh, shelf ice or the continental uh, ice cap is just a plain white area. You have cracks, you have crevasses, you have just really threats on there. I have a colleague um, in the expedition industry who drives those slashes for the Russian Antarctic program who has shared stories and pictures of those caterpillars almost drowning in um, hidden crevasses. So th there are a lot of obstacles. It's not just as easy as it um, appears to driving from the coastal station to uh, Vostok. So it's a, a lot of obstacles, but the major obstacle here is the logistics coming to the continent. But before we come to that, let's have a look into the new Vostok station itself, because in September this year, the um, institute or the the, the station, or the, yeah, the facility that built that station just completed it. Oh, and really? they just built it up in Russia to be examined by the uh, Minister of um, Environment, the Minister of Education. And they just went there and just had a 
had a look and uh, we just have some uh, material from that, like a, a video from here as there well. You go. And in that video, you can see um, Victoria Abramashenko, uh, who is a deputy prime minister um, of Russia, who visited that new built station. You can see it's just set up here. It's a look inside it and there's new... Modern. Yes, it's compared to the other st other station, to, to, to the recent station. It's a completely different world. A sauna, Even a sauna, pool table, pool table <laughs> taken. It looks a bit like a space station inside. And it looks like it can be home away from home. And then you just see at the end of the video, the officials coming in. Yeah, here you see the Deputy Prime Minister of Russia, uh, Victoria Abram Abramchenko. Uh, together with the Minister of Natural Resources and Environment, uh, Dmitry Koblikin, Minister of Education and Science, Valery Folkov, and of course the Novatak Chairman, uh, Leonid Mikkelsen, who, um, yeah, invested 4 billion rubles to uh, make that happen. The Russian Federation um, invested less money than the Novatak, so that's really a, a public-private partnership here in building that. However, once that's finished the ownership of that station goes completely to uh, to russia that's uh very very important however i see a lot of mock-ups uh, mock of that station where you um have the big um novatak logo painted onto that station yeah, yeah and if you scroll a down on the website opportunity there's uh it and it looks very it is Russian. It, it yeah it does <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here, here yeah, you see how they built it. This is interesting. So they, they had containers uh, that they put together and and then they covered it from the outside with some insulation and uh, and, and the, what you see on the outside. Of course, they, they learned from uh, a number of, um, of of previous experiences, not only in their own program, but also on other programs. Nice so it's a very modular, <laughs> exactly. It's a very modular uh, way of building it. And that also is uh, clearly connected to the logistics behind that. And the main logistics is it has to, to get to the continent at one point. Right. And you can't just start um, start building it um, on location, so you have to pre-build it, and that's what the the learnings of the expeditions in very in the very early times in the uh, hero heroic age of exploration was that they brought in like IKEA like uh, ready-made um, sets of buildings, and this is not different from that. So they have built it uh, in Russia in Saint Petersburg, and they are now um, dismantled it and loaded it onto a cargo vessel. And that's not it's, just it's simply a, a cargo it's a vessel. Flat, it's a flat pack uh, station, this flat pack Arctic research station. Does it come with, it little, with little screwdrivers and things? <laughs> it's I, I a nice idea. I, <laughs> I hope they have some proper tools. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I mean, the Russian way of doing things is, is, is a very um, basic, very manual uh, way. Right. Just very, there's, there's not much automated things Pragmatic. of building that kind of things. I think that's exactly, the word. <laughs> especially in that environment, that's exactly how you have to do it. Yes. So they, they loaded that to the only civil nuclear cargo vessel in the world, uh, the Sevmoput. And that cargo vessel just took all those 133 modules onto itself. It's the only vessel of that size that's able to carry the entire modules at once to Antarctica. So that saves a lot of money, a lot of time to be able to carry that in one, one way. So the Russians just mobilized not only that nuclear cargo vessel, but also four icebreaker, uh, three icebreakers. So a fleet of four ships carrying the supplies, carrying the material, but also the manpower. It needs 98 people to operate that whole huge enterprise, to unload the modules in Antarctica, to carry it from the Progress Station 1,500 kilometers to Vostok Station, and then also to build that, to, to uh, yeah, just actually set up the station. The whole time frame is supposed to be until 2024. So it's about four years time frame to finish the construction of the new Vostok station. And here begins what I would 
just say or just claim the lost year the apposite is titled at, the nuclear carrier, this cargo vessel, suddenly, beginning of October, it left in, in the 5th of October, it left St. Petersburg, and in the mid of October, it just suddenly slowed down in front of West Africa, turned around, and a few days later, turned around again. What? It looked like it was sailing back home to the north, and then... And, 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 and we know this because... Be the Russians because, because didn't you tell can, us that, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, obviously they didn't. And communication from the ship to the to the outside world is very, very limited. We know that oh, because wow. there are um, there are uh, receivers and transmitters who are just sending out signals of the ships. And we have a number of services where we can actually, um, yeah, just track the the movement of ships. And one of that tools is marine traffic. That's my preferred tool I have, um, I have it to, to use that. It's Exactly. And you see there, that's just a, a live view of the ships being um, around in West Africa right now or in the Atlantic. <laughs> Every single one of these little colorful things is a ship. And and that's not all of that. If you zoom in, you see more uh, of them as well. And all the different colors are different types of ships. So the green ones are cargo vessels, the blue ones are passenger ships, and so on and so on. Um, you, I think the purple ones are um, supply vessels for for oil and and stuff. So and there, you there, click there's on a, them and you get some more information. Oh, purple here is pleasure craft. There you pleasure go. Pleasure craft. That would be a cruise ship, right? And uh, not necessarily. It could be a yacht as well. Or, or a yacht. But, okay. So, uh, do ships have to have these kind of tracking capabilities? Yes. Is that internationally required, or do they have yes. an option? Or no, that's it regulated through the um, International Maritime Organization, IMO. Um, the amount of data you share, that's something that's, uh, that differs from, from company, from operator to it, operator, yes. from company to company. And there's probably a minimum size that you have to have for this. I mean, you, not, not every single tiny sailboat has to have one of these trackers on it. Or does it? Actually, uh, the sailboats uh, also have it. It really oh, depends really? On, uh, on 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 the um, as soon as you operate, I think in uh, into international waters, you need to have that. I'm so not sure. This is like the, 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 the marine version is. of flight radar websites. Exactly. Um, yes. This is live information of the actual vessels. And there are other um, other sources you can use as well, like for example, vesselfinder.com and so on and so on. Yeah. But here, for example, uh, in the Canary the Islands. Photo and everything. Wow. That depends on that's that's kind of crowdsourced, so it, it really depends on what informations are in the dat uh, database. And you can see that a lot of um, of photographers are just uh, uploading pictures from from several um, meetings from several uh, several occasions. And you can find, for example, in an older vessels, you find pictures where they're completely different painted. Like for example, uh, one of the vessels I worked on, uh, Ocean Diamond. There are pictures in there from the very, very beginning when it used to be a ferry. Um, there are pictures in there when it used to have a tender boat in the back uh, and the aft of the ship. Uh, and, and if you if you, you pay, have a number, you can get a bit more information as as well. Okay, exactly. It's sense. a professional tool. It's a professional tool for fleet managers who actually can see. It's a little bit like um, for cargo uh, trucks for lorries um, when you have a GPS signal in there and the companies just track where the car is and what just, speed and so on. This is just quite... the amount of stuff out there. Let's just look at this map. I mean, this is... <laughs> wow, okay. And just imagine it would be more in terms of traffic if we would have a full-scale um, yes. season going on um, in, in terms of, of cruise ships right now. It looks there really is, crowded from up here. <laughs> it does look crowded, but the, in, in terms of cruise ships, there's almost nothing going on. Now, yep. that's something you have to add into that picture then later as well. But you can use uh, the search bar on top and just um, type in the name of the vessel. And we just start with SEV. SEV. M, M O, yes, yes, and there you go. Seven more put. That's the container ship. That's the one that's, we're looking at. That's the, okay. So, so this is the nuclear ship that was uh, supposed to bring this the Vos the new Vostok station to the Antarctic, and it exactly. stopped and turned around. It slowed down, stopped, it, and turned around. 
Exactly. It slowed down um, somewhere in West Africa, and then it just turned around, um, say, so north. A photo of it. Yeah. And uh, then it turned around again and uh, continued its journey to the south with a reduced speed. So this vessel can, can go up to 20 here? knots. We can't. I think it's too long ago. Uh, you have the pass ah, track tool there. Just just give it a, a shot if you can, can see something there. Let's figure it out. So there is now only this vessel uh, visible. Show track option, select time period. Um, when did that happen? Oh, no, it only has um, two days. Mid, mid, okay. It only yeah, has two days. Two. So it's probably yeah. locked because I didn't pay anything for it. Okay. And this is also but that's the signal we location. have right no, it's not. That's the not. the last location. It has now left Coastal Area. So the GPS trackers, they um, send uh, signals in, in, in various ways. And one way is going through the mobile networks of the countries. And therefore, you need to be in a coastal area. As soon as you leave that, the position needs to uh, be transmitted through satellite. And that's an additional service you have to pay for yeah, at marine okay. traffic. And then you would see the um, the the actual recent position. Okay. So this is kind of a few days old. I think six seven days um, old, and the ship stopped it moving again. But what happened in that uh, time in between? It just went down to the coast of Angola and just did a very weird zigzag course. And that was when um, international media picked up this. Um, this weird behavior of the ship. Uh, in fact, it was uh, the, the independent Barents Observer, which is an Arctic newspaper in the Barents Sea. And they've picked that up, that signal. And we're just wondering where the zigzag course um, comes from. And it took quite a while to get some information. In fact, they got their information from social media. There is the <laughs> Russian version of Facebook called V Contact. And in the V contact, there is a group where they were chatting about that. And there was one source from the ship which says, it, as it's understood, there is a failure in the propulsion system. And it took a while to understand what that failure was. And it took even longer to get confirmation from official sources. This is what this happened. Is, um, this is concerning yeah? because we're talking about a nuclear vessel. So you don't really want anything to happen to that, especially not the propulsion system. Yeah, well, the the you have to understand the setup of the um, nuclear vessels, the nuclear um, the nuclear power plant they have on board. They create energy, and that energy is used for several things on board, as well as the propulsion system. Yeah. So it gets redirected to the generators of the propulsion system. Um, so it actually supplies the propulsion system. That that doesn't mean that something is wrong with the nuclear power plant on okay. board. What actually happened and what got confirmed later on is that the nuclear carrier, which just came out of the shipyard in St. Petersburg uh, Berg in um, January with a, f a complete overhaul and all the certifications needed to be able to um, get yeah, appointed into regular service again, lost a propeller blade in the middle of the Atlantic what? Ocean. What? Wait, 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 wait. A propeller blade. I mean, are so we we're talking about we're talking about a ship's propeller. This huge, big we thing. We talk about the ship's propeller, and in this particular ship, that's a single propeller propulsion system. So this huge vessel has one propeller, Whoa. one shaft, with four blades, and it loses one of the blades. How on earth does that happen? That's a big mystery, and I and haven't course, found course, any it, it, explanation for it. Of, and of course, it, it will be. It, it won't be able to turn without itself, uh, without it, it, without it destroying itself, right? Exactly. So you understand <laughs> this the slowdown this of the ship immediately if you know um, the the loss of the propeller blade. Then it makes sense to slow down the ship so the, the 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 power on the shaft itself is limited, but you still have some maneuverability for the ship itself. How that can happen? in the Atlantic Ocean with a depth, average depth of 2,000 meters where the ship traveled is something out of comprehension for me. I'm really curious about um, when this will be examined and um, hopefully 
analyzed and then just published. So they so they lost a propeller blade and the propeller blade. I guess when it's when you say it's about two thousand meters deep there, it's just gone, right? You, you can't just. It's go. gone. Yeah, it's that's gone. that's super heavy. That's gone. So what's going so on what, now? What's going on now is after they lost the propeller blade, they tried to find a solution for that. I mean, they have a very limited time frame um, to deliver that stuff to Antarctica. You have three other ships dedicated to support that mission. One, actually, the uh, Captain uh, Dranitsin, the icebreaker, was already ahead of that ship with 98 um, support staff on it. Right. They were already in, so they, they actually stopped when the, the ship had some difficulties. Then they continued the journey into um, the, the waters towards uh, Prince uh, Hawkenland. Uh, King Hawkenland uh, uh, at, an, at Antarctica, but then they just waited there. The seven the, the 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 carrier just went zigzag in front of Angola for one major reason. They can't just go ashore. They can't just go into the into a harbor because it's a nuclear vessel. So you have to have oh, not a lot to? of certifications. Okay. Every country has different regulations there. And one of the regulations here um, prohibited to go in. Another factor, of course, is the COVID-19 situation in the country. So oh, you man. need also to, to consider the quarantine uh, and so on. So that would just slow down everything. And out well, there, the Russians, you, cannot, you cannot just order a tow truck to pull you somewhere. Exactly. And that's a big thing here. It's a heavy, it's a, it's a, over I shouldn't laugh. I shouldn't it? laugh. This is a serious matter, but it's, it's so, it is. It's so crazy and wild that, yeah, okay. Keep, keep, go on, go on. If I remember correctly, it's a 260 meters long carrier. It's not even just pulling it somewhere. So they, like, the Russians came up with the idea of sending down a professional team of divers to work on it. So you have, a four blade propeller you're missing one propeller so yep. the symmetry of the propeller is gone the idea was to send in the divers to investigate the propeller and come up with options and one of the options they come up with is to cut off the propeller blade opposite to the lost one to create a yep. symmetry that, uh, to that be makes able, sense i mean you, you, it <laughs> does make sense to be able to at least move on a slow speed to get those 133 block modules from the new Vostok station to the progress station in a yeah. time frame where it's still possible to do something with that. And even, I mean, uh, and, and I, I suppose they do not have a spare propeller blade on board because... Even if they would have that. a spare propeller blade on board, yeah. you have to consider the weather they are out on the open sea. They are out on the 20-mile zone. They need to be out of the national waters of Angola because of the COVID situation, because of the nuclear uh, origin of the vessel. And in the open waters, you want to execute a propeller blade operation? How is that possible? That's, that's a, a major operation. Yeah, you, would, you, would, you, you would take a ship out of the water to do that. Exactly. It usually would go into a dry dock to, to oh, be man. able to, to, to work on it. Just the attempt of doing so, it's miraculous for me. It's just really what those people have done, those divers, they're just heroes to me. I have no idea how they managed that. So 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 have they do you know if they've already done that? Have they cut off the the opposite blade and and if yes, At what least have they done the with news. it? Have they just discarded that or that's a very good question. I, I don't know what happened to the blight. The, the, the news, the confirmation we have from um, the, the Rosatom uh, uh, float, the, the company that actually operates all uh, civil uh, nuclear vessels in Russia, just confirmed that they cut off one of the propeller blights and they tried to um, create the symmetry. However, the sea trials, and that's this weird zigzag course we, uh, we could see on those pictures earlier, um, it's just an indicator they tried some seat trials and um, figured that even though they created the symmetry and they had the idea of being able with a symmetry to move on slow um, on, on, a, on a slower speed towards the destination, it just doesn't work out and it's just way too dangerous. So after almost two months in the area, they just decided to call them back home to cancel the entire operation and just get the ship back to St. Petersburg on a very low speed. They are now traveling uh, between six and 10 knots. Um, that's less oh, than that half is really of what slow they... for a ship like that. 
yeah, th what is it? Six or ten, um, let's say ten knots is, I think, like 22, 23 kilometers per hour. Yes. That's really slow travel. That, that These really ships normally go, go at least twice as, as far, right? Uh, fast. Yeah. And they're going back to St. Petersburg now where the whole load will be um, taken off the ship and then the ship goes into a dry dock and then I'm really curious about the results of that examination, what actually happened there. Well, at least it's maneuverable. I mean, just imagine a ship like this not being able to maneuver. That would be way more dangerous. So better Indeed. slow than, than, than no control in that respect. So what happened is that the, the other icebreaker, which was already a hat, just spent a month in the ice of an Arctic waters and then needed to turn around. They went to, to Cape Town. They stayed a while in Cape Town where we actually got some uh, some contact with the colleague of mine who is actually on board right now because he was supposed to be um, one of the support staff to carry the new um, elements to the Vostok station. And then they left as well to actually accompany um this nuclear carrier back home so they now just met um somewhere in the um atlantic ocean and now are traveling um together and they're expected somewhere late uh, december early january back in uh st petersburg they hope to be um back home on the 31st of december but i'm not sure about making that forecast oh, so wow. having having this situation here which affects the entire season and not only like the building materials for the um, new Vostok station but also the supply materials for the next winter that sets a big question mark oh that ship also had the had the had the food and everything for the station up it's, there it's the whole operation of that it's not oh. only that one ship it's four ships in total that connected to that operation so what what's happening right now is that one of the um of the support icebreakers the uh Tryoshnikov, uh the academic Tryoshnikov, is um just sent from Bremerhaven where it was uh, stationed um the past weeks um down and there are some rumors going on in Russian uh, news that it might just uh, just catch up with the nuclear carrier somewhere in, uh, in the Atlantic and just um, exchange some containers. If you understand something about open water exchanges, that's everything but easy. So that's a, yeah. another major operation there. Apart from that, they already have some supply materials on board of the uh, academic Tereshnikov. And we'll send that down to Antarctica now to use the last remaining time window we have to actually be able to deliver the supply materials for winter, for the winter season. Otherwise, that would just really result in um, a closure uh, for winter of those stations, which is apparently not an option for Russian science. So you see, it's not only this one uh, ship, which is a significant impact on its own because it has the entire station on board and it's the only ship of that size that's A, capable of moving to Antarctica, but also to carry the modules. It affects the entire Russian Antarctic program. Wow. <laughs> this is crazy. What a story. What a crazy wild story. Um, so, so now we have two things to track. We'll have to keep track of the of the iceberg, and we have to keep track of <laughs> this ship and what that means. But okay, so so no, no new Vostok station um, in the Antarctic for now. Not for now. It will delay probably for about a year. Uh, they definitely will wow. try next year, and um, yeah, let's see how that turns out. A ship losing part of its propeller. That's not a very that's in open waters. Tough. In open, in waters. open waters, it's that's, not in a coastal area. That's not something that is like that you see every day. Not really. No, I've never heard of that actually happening. Ever. Me neither. <sighs> okay. Um. I guess with that we can close this episode. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um. Thanks everyone for watching. Uh. You might have been sitting there going like this as well. So. Uh. Yeah, let's keep an eye we on that. We put some and more links into the show notes. So if, you, if you're if curious, yeah. just go on and uh, just research a little bit yourself. It's interesting and yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's compelling and interesting. And, and I, have to, I have to point out, as usual, Henry, 
you have done an amazing job putting together very comprehensive show notes. So if you're just listening to that, just tap in the description. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, tap in the description. There's a whole lot of interesting, good information in there um, for you with links and everything that we talked about pretty much. So um, make sure you have a look. And in general, we hope that you enjoyed this episode. And um, if you want to get in contact, if you have remarks on what we do or if you miss a topic let us know um we have uh, we are on info at Cur our email is info at um you can find us at curiously polar on the usual suspect social media and of course all the other episodes are wherever you listen to your podcasts and um with that have a good one and we'll be back in a week from now until then take care bye bye take care bye